pull off the gate, pull off the gate, pull off the gate. Looks like they've got at least a Liberator, Idris, Kraken, bad new merchantman even. Okay, I don't know what the sport is. Sport looks like it's going to be fighters. Pull off the gate, pull off the gate, pull off the gate. Switch over to harassment, switch over to harassment. I want to see everybody in eclipses in the next five minutes. Get gone, get gone. First ship's landed. It's got two Super Hornets on board, taken off. Beware, it's got PDS. Welcome to a series of videos. I'm going to try to establish what capitals look like in 2022 by looking at what we have now. And I would say beyond 2022 as well. I'm going to do Liberator on its own video and then kind of work through them. The Idris, the Kraken, and the BMM. And I'm going to add on as needed. Hopefully we'll have some information about the Polaris, uh, you know, coming up with the annual sale there should be some hints and some other then quasi caps you know the percy the nautilus etc so th this should be kind of fun i'll kind of mix them in between my videos I, I i thought about doing like a video covering all four of the first caps and then it occurred to me that by the time i finally get it out the door this sale could be near over or over and people won't have a lot of time to act or no time to act to make a decision about whether to purchase the ship or not. Uh, sometimes CIG will post on a random Reddit post or a random Spectrum post what the, the sale ends at. I haven't seen one yet. I've searched around, uh, posted on a couple discords, and uh, haven't really found that. The good news is, though, I found plenty of information about the Liberator. Now, the Liberator picture that I prefer is the one on your screen now. But I'm also going to put up the engineering one for a moment, just so you can kind of get an idea of what it what the engineering build was. And uh, that was a completely different creature. So let's kind of go with that. That takes away the ramp areas in the center. So what we're at looking at right now includes the engineering, that circular area below the flight, the, the, the primary vehicle deck and technically uh, via air ship deck if you're brave enough to quote the ship to ship talk to people <laughs> and uh shows that there, there's a walkway between both sides of the ship so both sides are connected for the crew for the crew that's going to become important as we continue to talk about this uh you're going to see me kind of switch back to the other design that does not show that walkway does not show that circular engineering area that is only crew accessible and that's kind of the interesting thing about this ship. Unlike many other cap, even capitals, it, this ship is specifically designed to have two different sides to the coin. So on your left side, if you're facing the front of the ship, the left side of the ship has the crew area, including the bridge, including the man turret, uh, including all, uh, access to all sorts of interesting things. And including this engineering area through the through the walkway, and then if the crew walks along this walkway, or if public personnel walk out into the deck, uh, they could access then on the right side of the ship the armory and jump room with the sixteen seats, the pilot quarters and ready room as they're called, and there is still hot debate about whether or not that that pilot quarters includes beds. So let's get right to the topic here. This ship was envisioned to be almost a, a like an inter intersystem ferry service for larger systems like Pyro, where it would be a necessity where smaller ships would not be able to, in any reasonable amount of jumps, be able to quantum across the system, where they could get a ride on this ship, and this ship could then take them to where they need to be. Also, this ship has its own auxiliary fuel tanks that allow in in process refueling so while it's moving around it can be refueling the ships that are apparently on the first floor as well as the upper floor i called it the double decker hercules in a previous video and that's kind of a great way to start thinking about it but it goes beyond that by having the second floor as an exposed deck you can see in the bottom right corner the outside view of the ship by having that exposed area for two small ships like we're talking about Hornet size, Hurricane size, that kind of size of ship. Um, and then also an extra, 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 extra small uh, pad on the front of the ship that can fit 
an Argo or a something like a Pisces, those type of ships, you have a lot of versatility in this vessel because they can simply take off and land right on top of the ship without having to move around. Now, in comparison, other ships like the Idris have to have to move ships through. It's like you have to move the first ship in order to get the second ship out. Or if you're in the third ship, you would have to spin 180 degrees and and then and sl and move out of the the Idris's deck from from the rear of the uh, of the ship uh, to avoid like a traffic jam, basically trying to hop over the other ships because it's all internal. But that also means that they're not protected. What we've learned from the Kraken's decks is that all those ships that sit on top of the Kraken deck exposed have to rely on their own shields in order to have protection. They are not protected by the shields of the Kraken. We can extrapolate from that that, that that this will be the same situation with the Liberator. Ships that are on the exposed exterior of the ship will have to be left on, probably with their engines off, so you don't have that animation cutting down on people's graphics and making noise and such. And consuming, you know, in theory, could even consume fuel down the road. Uh, so uh, turning the engines off, but leaving other systems online. But that also increases the EM and and thermal signature of the entire ship. That shouldn't be too big of an issue, though, because we're talking about a capital logistics vessel here. Uh, in the John Crew called it a transporter, through and through transporter, with the ideas of the art team talking about that it is a inspired by a ferry or an assault amphibious ship from a military force in modern day. And I kind of can see how it has both mindsets, where a ferry has these areas that are accessible to the public, and then areas that are locked off, only accessible to crew, like the well decks, the engine areas, the, the bridge of the ship. It, you know, those areas are not accessible. And if, for whatever reason, the ferry had its own manned turret systems and unmanned turrets, they would not be accessible to the, to the, uh, to the visitors either. Now... This ship has dual size 2 PDSs that defend it from incoming missiles and torps. Uh, they are automated. Interestingly, the, uh, the PDS system is placed above the, the public side of the ship. And I'll, I'll, put, I'll try to put up a picture here, like a more detailed picture, but there is walkways all over the top of the ship. There's like these, there's even staircase that, that is like welded into the ship that you can walk up. It is entirely possible the crew is expected to have to EVA out there and walk up to refill the uh, the PDS. I don't see this as a situation like in the Matrix where they just have people walking over with carts full of ammunition and the machine just keeps firing and firing and firing. Um, it, once it runs out of ammo, it runs out of ammo. And um, those systems are really just, uh, you know, a wing and a prayer. A couple PDS is, is not going to save this ship from a major assault. It needs to have protection. Fortunately, it has two serious sized ships on its decks. I mean, if you're talking about a pair of, say, Hornets or even Super Hornets or Hurricanes or, or some combination thereof of those kind of ships, that is nothing to sneeze at. And if that frontal position has, like, say, a Pisces with four size ones, even that can help contribute to the fight. On top of that, it does have a single man turret on, on top of the ship. So it, it, there's a lot going on here. I, I, I see this ship as a, it's a limited capital. It's a capital kind of due to its size. It does hold 400 SCU. And I see this ship as something to consider if you were almost the anti-capital person. I, you don't want to have a gazillion bunks. You don't want the maintenance and upkeep of a much larger ship. You don't need all the massive amount of services, and your budget can't, or, or, or all those things, whether they matter or not, your, your budget simply cannot function, it can't, can't swing, say, the cost of an Idris, the cost of a JAV, or even the cost of you know something that is more reasonable that could be coming down the line. Uh, we still have waiting in the wings, other theories of what ships. We have a rumor mill that is endless about other possibilities for cap ships and quasi-cap ships. We also have ships like the Polaris, Nautilus, and the Hammerhead, which their price is slightly above, I mean, like two, 300 USD more than what we're seeing the introduction of the Liberator at Warbond going to be. I think the 575 USD for the non-war bomb variant is closer to what we'll see the steady price at, but I, I think that price is going to go up 100 or 200 USD, honestly. 
I, I think that this ship has too much capabilities and value. However, I don't think they're going to go too crazy with this thing. It doesn't have size 10 torps like a Polaris. It doesn't have the massive guns of the Percy. It, it's not going to augment the battlefield like the A2. Uh, they're not going to try to limit by price with, with this type of ship. It, 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 it's needed. In the words of multiple people during the ship talk, they kept referencing Pyro being three, uh, just around three times the size of Stanton, and about how they realized that they need more logistics vessels that are able to allow these smaller ships to move around. And I think this is going to be one of the ships that kind of brings the group together. So the orgs that have these ships on standby and can move around with this ship will 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 really prosper in a place where there is limited services uh, stanton has only has as many many stations uh, almost every single grange point every single moon every single place you, you turn you hit that b key and there's a bazillion places to go and many of them have services maybe limited services but services and when when we go to talk about pyro there's only one major station ruin station and Ruin Station may be many things covered by pirates and such, but it is a full functioning station. And it is the only station in the entire system that can lay claim to that. The other stations, you'll be lucky if you get basic services, if they're even open for business. Or you may even come across, an, uh, you know, they showed art for places with asteroids that collided into them. Maybe you can find some reserve fuel laying around in some t uh, tanks that were laying there that need to be salvaged. And you, mind you, you're dodging NPC and player pirates also trying to loot the station. This is the type of environment we're talking about. The inconsistency and the danger of this location is going to make any certainty, such as being able to jump on a ship that has refueling built in and has services and has 400 SCU that can be packed away with spare parts and such that you can bring with you. Even if you can't hand repair the damage that you've had or, or fixes and rearm and such beyond hand handwork. I think this ship's going to be important. And that brings me to the next point. The Liberator has not been stated to have the ability to do significant repairs and the type of rearming that you can expect on a military class vessel or a Dracified vessel either. Um, you see the hangers when you see the Kraken and the, the dual hangers it has on board below f designed for smaller ships like the Buccaneer, they, they have gantries above the ship that are physically able to move engines around. They have the ability to, 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 to store uh, 3,900 or so SCU of, of, of cargo or on that privateer, uh, just over 900 SCU of cargo. Uh, these ships have significant storage space and the hangar to use it. The Liberator brings one part of the equation, 400 SCU of space and the fueling, but it doesn't bring the secondary part of the equation. I see a ship that can bring that second part of the equation, like another capital ship, or, and also, topic for another day, but medical is going to be a major factor. Fixing the person, fixing the pilot, fixing the gun crew, these are the people that are also going to be a factor on the Liberator. It occurred to me when I was thinking about the Liberator's weaknesses, I kind of like made like a little chart for myself, kind of a I, have, I use a whiteboard for a lot of my discussions, and then I think of a couple points of each thing, and then I work through those about, like, well, what do I do if I was in that ship? Well, what would I do if I was in that ship? Well, one of the biggest problems with the Liberator is if it is boarded or if it is attempted to be taken by the public crew, by the public group that could be up to 16 players, there's only two crew on board the ship, and that is necessitated because there's only two beds. So long term, there's only two crew. Now you could turn to your org mates as, as escorts on other ships around you. You could also have a situation where you can pack the ship with a couple org uh, friendly org org f folks in that side, armed to the teeth on the public side, and with the understanding that visitors cannot keep their weapons with them when they're in that public side or anywhere on the ship. They get to keep them within their vehicles. And they're not allowed near their vehicles during flight. You could do a few interesting things like that, but I, I just can't help but think that you have a bunch of random people in your ship with a Nova tank they could bring on board. They could do a lot of havoc, uh, you know, and, and do a lot of damage, or at the very least, at, at the very least, uh, hold the the cargo hostage. The 400 SCU space is right next to where you put the land vehicles inside on the first floor is mainly for land vehicles. It can fit ballista, it can fit Novas, it, it can fit some serious hardware. And that's a lot of trust you place in who you move around. And remember, this ship is supposed to be some type of 
you know, informal, maybe you get some wages out of it, people to move, you know, a contract you, you do between your org and theirs. So you're going to have to build that reputation. You're going to have to build that level of trust. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people have some surprises and some teething with this ship that maybe you haven't thought about. Uh, but the biggest thing is if the ship gets attacked internally or is boarded, the ship only has two actual crew. The people on board hopefully are friendly and they'll help defend you. So let's say in a good, let's, let's pick that scenario. The public facing folks run to their vehicles and they get their, they get their weapons or they're trusted enough where they're carrying their weapons in the public side. You open that ramp underneath that, that walkway underneath the, the, the first floor and they're allowed to enter and they're allowed to flood into the side to, to defend the bridge, defend the critical parts of the ship, the engineering area and such. Well, as the fight continues, you're missing one of the major advantages of being on a capital ship as the defender. It's that it doesn't have medical. There is no medical bay on board this ship. So I would obviously pack a few medical guns, the dedicated medical systems and some multi-tools with medical and all the drugs, of course. But that's only going to help so much. Having a regeneration location or at the very least tier three beds, you know, uh, to, to support you is a good idea. Now with regeneration and tier two beds, the, the ones that really are allow proper respawn and regeneration uh, and above, uh, the game has been changed. If you're defending an Idris, if you're defending even uh, Polaris, if you're defending these ships that have this capacity built in, an 890 jump, a Carrick, you can fill the medical area with a couple Devastator shotguns and even leave a couple suits of uh, helmets and some suits laying in the store medical storage room or just laying on the floor during right before a fight starts or during a fight. And, and now you've got a defense. They not only have to fight your team once, you regenerate, and now they have to they have to take the medical facility as well. And you, you have a second wave of fight where the, where the offense does not have that capacity. At best, they have a ship nearby that they're regenerating on if they die, and they're over there now. They're no longer on board the ship. So I, I think that's an interesting side to this ship is that the Liberator has a lot of insider threat that, that I, I think people need to be very careful of and considerate of and be aware of its limitations. It will need escort, especially in, in, in places it's actually intended to be used. It will need the ability for orgs to be considerate of, of its insider threat considerations, and it will work very well with other ships. This thing is almost an Idris. I mean, in some ways, it actually surpasses an Idris's ability to carry vehicles uh, and ships. That's incredible. And it, refueling capacity on board, 400 SCU of storage. It, it has the PDSs already, nowhere near as many as an Idris has. But I'm focusing down on the Idris because this thing is nipping at its heels. And if you're primarily interested in logistics and you're interested in keeping your budget right, your org should consider having a couple of these. And I'm carefully wording that because I'm starting to learn that everybody... If everybody in different groups is specialized, try not to have every single person specialized in the same ship. So talk with your org mates. Have honest discussions, especially with any you really trust and you have close friends that you know you'll be playing with the same time zones and you'll be operating in kind of a mesh configuration. If one person has a Carrick and one person has a Liberator, you've already got a party. And that's a really cool thing. And it's very easy to fill these ships. I think that there's a lot of focus on people trying to carry the weight of an entire group of their entire fleet and that's fine that's up to you but if you don't have that budget or if you're trying to carefully consider where to place your budget no matter what size it is this ship is a great asset in your arsenal especially if you have new money that war bond price is hard to beat if you have concierge grab the one with the condor skin the white skin and um, really enjoy it and that's kind of where i'm at with this ship it's a ship of two mines. It has the ferry service. It has the crew side. It does not have beds for the public. It has, uh, ob obviously, it is meant for a longer distance travel, but not too long travel. Remember, that means that people on board the ship that are not your crew cannot log out. They may relent. CIG has relented in the past. I think of the Valkyrie, where it wasn't able to carry cargo in its vehicle spaces. I've heard a lot of really neat ideas 
people already saying the same idea as the Valkyrie, where why can't we put cargo where the internal uh, pads are? And so either or a vehicle or cargo, like on many ships like the Valkyrie. Uh, we've also heard people suggest ideas like having that ready room be able to fold away its table and have a couple bunks, at least, you know, two or three. And the idea being people, you know, that are more status, more trusted could be up there and then have the armory and jump room basically for everybody else, for the public. So kind of segmenting the ship yet more than it already is. I, I, I honestly would argue that this ship is purposely limited. Uh, its auxiliary fuel tanks are reasonable in size. I, I think they're not quite the same size as a Kraken bases. When you look at a Kraken base, those large circles, those are nearly two-story tall fuel tanks, and that's a person standing in that room. I mean, just to give you some perspective on the size of those auxiliary fuel tanks, when those are ripped out on the Kraken Privateer, that makes up 10 plus habs and uh, the common areas for the people, the, the shopkeepers. So I, I think that's some perspective on the sheer scale and size of some of the capitals that are already forecast to be in the game. And those, those ships may need balanced haircuts, dare I say it. They may not. I, I think that they're going to come in the game full scale, and I think they're going to be suffering from the cost is going to stay the same or not scale, scale even more when they're finally flyable. I think also their maintenance is going to be far higher. I do not see some, a ship that's hyper-specialized like the Liberator, cap or not, to have to suffer the same level of maintenance as a full-fledged capital-class ship. So I, that's kind of where I, I, I feel it is. Now, on the topic of should I melt my Polaris or, or my Nautilus or my Hammerhead for this thing, I've I've now spoken to three from people who have suggested that they're doing that or they're, they're popping in Discord chatting about that. Uh, look, this ship is good. This ship is only good, though, when you have other people you're working with. Polaris, you can put a couple people in that ship and do a lot of things. The Percy, you can put maybe even two or three people on that ship and do a lot of interesting things. And you can run contracts with those things. There will be missions for capital-class ships, and those are the entry-level capitals, if you really want to be honest, for those type of capital-class missions. We'll see the limitations of them when they're finally in-game, but that's, that's the difference. This is a concept ship, just like the rest of them, that is not, that is not currently envisioned of what it's going to have for a crew. We, I don't know if they're going to – what I'm getting at is I don't know if they're going to stick to two people. I, I, I think this may go up to three crew at a minimum, and I think they may flesh out the one side where they relent and add two or three or four, even four bunks on the one side of the ship. So small changes like that may happen from concept through white box, through gray box, white box phase and everything, that whole process, and then finally release after all of those other steps. Uh, things can happen. And once again, they listen to the community, I'd like to think, and, and kind of see where this ship should be balanced on, from there, from the mindset of the game creators and, and kind of come to a happy p place for everybody involved. I see this ship as a net winner. I don't think it's going to take forever to get this ship. I would not, dare I say it, this is utter speculation, but I, I literally could see this ship coming in in late 2022. I, I think this ship is needed. I think that, that we have the, we've seen the Hercules series is wrapped up. This ship is just a hyper Hercules in a lot of ways. It doesn't have a lot of the mega services of a capital ship. It doesn't have a lot of the overhead of a large capital ship. But the only real major holdout is if it's on a 50-player server, this thing's running around. And I, I shudder to think what two of these things running around a 50-player server would be doing because they're <laughs> there's 18 people on board at a minimum. I, don't, I just put up information from Chad McKinney, who is a senior lead gameplay engineer at CIG, and he posted up information about the Star Citizen by answering questions from folks who asked him on Twitter yesterday and today, today being the 12th of October, uh, about 
information that didn't come up in the 30 minute presentation at citizen con on the servers and he reiterated that they're going to continue to work in additional folks so dent what they call denser shards so that would increase the player count on shards have better fault tolerance so less risk of 30ks increased stability of, of instances and he went in depth on a couple things they're up on your screen here and I'll include a link to his Twitter account so you would go to tweet and replies on his Twitter account and you can see some of these in case there's new ones that come up uh, if there's any beyond the afternoon of October 12. And uh, one of the things that he pointed out was that they want to stick to regional shards where you're not stuck in those regional shards, but you, you can jump around, but they don't want to go to a global system just yet. And they want to continue to reinforce the regional shards to become stronger and stronger and have better scalability at this point because there's some major concerns with trying to do a global shard system when they're already just trying to reinforce the, the regional shards and have a better persistence uh, overall across all the shards. Um, so if you, you know, make progress in one shard, you'll be able to move around to another uh, regionally is no issue with that, which is something we've already had enjoyed, but I think he wants to reinforce that, especially with 3.15 localized inventory so a lot of exciting stuff. And um, this is uh, one of the things that we needed to hear about. I wish there was some timing on this, but this is all we have, that they are working on it, and hopefully we'll see denser shards that are good for fault tolerance and recovery in the future, which means there'll be better higher player counts and confidence in larger ships as those player counts grow on each shard. You know, that actually designed for up to 18 players each. So that's the only major problem that I think is going to be holding this thing back is where is server numbers at? Are we consistently at, say, 75 or 100 or more players by the time this thing comes in? And that kind of puts me at that mindset of optimistically, well, is the end of 2022 a realistic number to see 75 or 100 players in a server? And, and in theory, in theory, the starts of testing of jump gate, of uh, uh, jump system of, you know, uh, uh, of wormhole tech and, and, and eventually pyro, you know, it, that's kind of where my mindset is. This ship really should be in before pyro is, I'd like to think. Um, I'd like to see them get the teething issues out of it because this ship is needed. Especially if we don't have an Idris, we don't have a Kraken in the field. We don't have a Kraken on the on the field. Uh, ships that require even more crew, ships that will not just once in a while have eighteen players on board, will have immense amount of players on board. You know, we, we if you look at the number of man turrets on either of those ships, and then add on the engineering, the the mechanical people, the bridge crew, uh, the, it gets huge fast and that's not even getting into the privateer and all of the shops the 10 shops on top of all that number that number can skyrocket and no just because you have just just because we'll probably see the rudimentary beginnings of npcs at some point soon does not mean that there are going to be no intensivity each npc is going to require some resources on the server even if it's just a gunner on your ship so i yeah that's kind of where I'm at now. This ship it embodies a lot of the hopes and optimism for 2022 that I have. But at the same time, it is limited mainly by other things outside of itself. But do I see it as a good investment for the near future? Absolutely. If you're logistics minded, grab it. If you are someone who sees themselves running missions 24 seven, this is not the ship for you. Think of the Polaris, think of the Percy. They will both be for sale, almost guaranteed, at the annual ship sale starting at the, at the end of November. Last year, I think it was November 21 uh, th through through all the way to the beginning of December. So you, you have to think about th there is other options. It's very easy to get caught up in the glitz and glamour and make huge decisions, like start melting huge things. And it, it may not be your best option, or it may be. So that's kind of where I'm going to leave you. Make your own decisions, but think carefully. And when you're thinking of a ship, especially a ship designed to haul a bunch of other people's ships, it might be best to talk to other people that you trust. Talk to your org mates, 
find out who's grabbing one of these, find out who already has a Hercules or and other ships that are comparable in some way, and find out what they're doing with them. Is there already plans in your org for these type of ships? Is there even bigger ships on the horizon? If your org has, say, three Krakens or something, that, that this, this ship may not be necessary except for the near term. So then you need to think, okay, maybe this ship is worth picking up, but let me have an escape methodology for this ship. I'll pick the ship up, and then at the annual sale or next year's annual sale, I'll grab a CCU to a Polaris or a Percy or even something like you know like that or a Nautilus if you're more minded of defensive, and especially indie minded. I've been uh, suggesting those to folks that are considering uh, protecting mining operations. A mining ship is a great force multiplier, and a capital mining vessel is an incredible asset to have. So that's just some ideas that I've been talking about myself with folks when they come to me about this ship, and I hope that these helped you out. I'll do another video uh, with some questions once we get some more answers. Uh, so if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel. This is the kind of stuff I do all day uh, when, when I can. It's a hobby of mine. It's a passion. But uh, I've been in this this uh, game since the beginning, and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. So uh, thank you for your uh, feedback. If you if you have offered any below or if you reach out to me, I'm available, all, as always, on Discord at RedJ, hashtag 0001. Thank you all, and fly safe. Oh, and keep an eye out for Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is kind of be coming up. The Idris will be the next uh, topic. <laughs>